Welcome to the launch of the CQC 2019-2020 uh, State of Care Report, um, which I'm sure you agree comes at an unprecedented time for health and care in England. In keeping with the times, this is a virtual briefing and it is being recorded and will appear later on our YouTube channel. Um, after I introduce you to the rest of the panel, and Ian, Ian will talk you through our uh, key messages from this year's State of Care Report, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, please type your questions into the, uh, the, the chat function uh, with your name, and if you represent an organisation, that as well. Um, if you like a particular question that you see, um, then please uh, upvote it. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can in the time we have available. Uh, but there are over, uh, a, there are over well, quite a few of you on, on the call today, so I want to make sure that this, this works well. This is our first uh, time we've, uh, we've done this. So let me just uh, introduce you to the panel. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Ian uh, Trenham, our Chief Executive. Good morning. Rosie Benoweth, the Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care. Kate Taroni, Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care. And Ted Baker, Chief Inspector of Hospitals. Good morning. Okay, I'll now hand over to Ian, who can talk you through the key measures in this year's report. Ian. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this year's briefing on the state of health and adult social care in England in 2020. Good. Um, our purpose as the regulator is to make sure that health and social care services provide safe and high quality care. So we provide assurance to the public around the quality and safety of care, but we also encourage care services to improve. So our report this year, as in every year, comes at comes at the, at, the, at the challenge for health and social care from those two perspectives, what we've seen from an assurance point of view and how we are encouraging uh, improvement. And we do that by asking five questions that range from, from how safe a service is through to how well led it is. And we have those, those conversations with the 31,000 uh, registered providers that range in size from a, a person who is perhaps working part time offering domiciliary care uh, in their locality through to a multi billion pound turnover ac acute, acute NHS hospital with all points in between from GPs, from dentists, from ambulance services and so on. What we see time and time again, though, is that all of these services, regardless of size or complexity, are powered by extraordinary people who show extraordinary professionalism day in, day out. And that dedication of all of those people who work and volunteer in health and social care is what makes the difference. Everyone in all sectors should be recognised for all of their work, not just during the COVID period, but for many of us on, on the call who have the privilege of talking to people who work in these services day in, day out, know that that extraordinary professionalism has been something which has shown in, has been shown every day, not just during the COVID period. Our report effectively has two parts to it that which was going on before COVID and that which has happened since March. Before COVID, what we saw was a story of a set of health and social care services, which were broadly good. The chances of getting good care in this country are pretty high uh, across all of the sectors that we regulate. And, then, and the, the ratings for sectors at an aggregate level were broadly the same as last year, with the possible notable uh, positive exception of NHS acute trusts, where again, for the, the, there's, there's been a, a small increase in the quality of services offered by acute trusts, up from 65% being good last year to 67% this year. But that is a year on year incremental increase in quality in those services. And, and I think people that work in acute trusts should be applauded for, for that. But beneath the surface of those aggregate numbers uh, lies a number of very significant challenges. Over 40% of maternity services that were rated requires improvement for safety. More than half of urgent and emergency care services were rated requires improvement for inadequate. And almost a third of medical care services and outpatients were rated requires improvement or inadequate. And, and, and just under half of independent ambulance services were either inadequate or requires improvement. And when we look at, at mental health services, we have particular concerns, as we flagged last year, uh, for inpatient wards for people with learning disabilities and autism. 
and, and, and of those, 13% of those services were rated inadequate, up from 4% the year before. That was a trend we started to flag this time last year, and that has continued uh, during, during this year. And in GPs, 192 GP practices improved to good on reinspection, but a similar number declined from good. And in social care, we've been talking about the fragility of the sector for a while now. We still think that there's a need for investment and workforce planning and a long term funding solution. What does all of this mean, though, uh, in terms of key themes? We've seen longer waiting times and difficulty with access to timely diagnosis, screening and treatment. We've had people talking to us about longer wait times for routine GP and dental, dental appointments. We've seen people talk about poor access to mental health services, particularly for younger people. And we've, we've heard people tell us about a lack of suitable nursing care in homes and poor access to good home care. And over one and a half million people are registered with GP practices that have deteriorated in quality this year. All of that is fine, but what does that really mean on the ground for, for, for people? In social care, that means someone like Rhonda, uh, she may experience a high turnover of staff in adult social care. And that could mean that she now sees different care workers much more frequently than before who don't really understand her needs, which means she may get care. But is it of the sort of quality that all of us would want for our loved ones? And over 40 percent of maternity services are rated requires improvement for safety. So for someone like Toyin, this could mean that during labour, her baby's heart rate is being monitored by a member of staff who hasn't had up to date training to use the equipment properly. So that might mean that that member of staff is not able to spot if, if Toyin's baby is in trouble. And in learning disability and autism services, for someone like Dan who's autistic, he's been admitted to hospital due to a lack of community support during a crisis. This could mean he isn't receiving the high quality person-centered specialized care from staff who are trained to support him to leave hospital. This means Dan spends much more time in hospital than he needs to. And in general practice, it means that someone like Raj has to wait a long time to see his GP and that, that will delay, ultimately delay his referral for a cancer diagnosis. Let's de delve a little bit deeper into some of these challenges. We've talked about the fragility of the adult social care sector. We think, we said before, that failing to agree a funding solution continues to drive instability in the sector. And, it, and this graph simply shows that over, a, over the last few years, the turnover with adult social care has, has got worse. This means that adult social care is effectively turning its workforce over every two to three years. This means that on the ground, uh, an adult social care manager who we want to be focused on safety and quality is actually focusing on recruitment and making sure they've got enough staff to do the basics well. And we know that pressure across the, the, the primary and secondary care has, ha, is an ongoing challenge. If we look at uh, referral to treatment times, as this, as this graph shows, it shows that, that, that there has been a su succession of winter pressures. You can see by the, the sawtooth pattern of the, of the top line there. Um, but what we saw here was at lockdown, uh, services changed quite profoundly. There was an extreme focus on services for COVID patients. And of course, that was the right thing to do. But it doesn't alter the fact that there is now a very significant backlog of care. And there are people in that backlog who will need to be looked after. And when we look at, at GPs, there's been lots of conversations about, about GP appointments and online appointments and so forth. And this graph, I think, says a couple of things. It says that, that in the early part of the year, that there was a small but significant number of appointments for GP practices were carried out on the telephone and online. But the majority of appointments were carried out face to face. That's the dark blue line at the bottom part of the graph. But obviously, during lockdown, two things happened. One was a significant reduction in the number of appointments and the, the, the ratio between face to face and remote consultations, again, changed quite dramatically. So as we fast forward to July on this graph, what we're seeing is GPs working incredibly hard to, to make up ground and to get those appointments back in. But we also see a big shift towards uh, towards remote consultations for many people and for many conditions. This is exactly right. And people will, will see this as a real positive development. But as a regulator, we want to be working alongside GPs to understand, is that the right ratio? 
are, is that ratio right uh, for individual circumstances, for individual practices in individual communities? Because one size does not fit all. But we also see the big, the big valley uh, that this graph also uh, represents. It shows that the, the shortfall in, in appointments during the course of the year. In a service where, where people were already telling us that they were struggling to get, a, get access to a GP appointment, to have this many appointments not in the system is, is, is potentially significant. For some of those people that would have used those appointments, they may have got better themselves. But for many of those people, perhaps people with, with new conditions, they're perhaps feeling unwell, or, position, or people who were working with their GP practice to manage a complex long-term condition, they've simply not seen a, a healthcare professional. And we would certainly join the calls that the NHS are making uh, and GP leaders are making to say, GPs are open for business, please come and see your GP and have your condition condition look at that's something we would very much support and this is a this is about this 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 feels like something which is in part a, a call on patients to, to to come forward and and talk about their conditions and in part a call to to to, um, to, to gps to make sure that they are clearly open for business and they're giving the uh, the signals locally that that, that that they welcome patients back into their surgery our report talks a lot this year about inequalities. We know that prior to COVID, we saw a number of people who had poorer health outcomes, people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, people with disabilities, and of course, people who come from, uh, from, from, from more deprived backgrounds. Those people had well-documented poorer health outcomes than others. And COVID has simply magnified that problem. We think that, that what needs to happen now is health and care services need to take advantage of the, of, of the um, shock to the system that COVID has, has delivered and, and think about how they redesign services as we come out of this first wave of COVID and design those services around uh, people's needs to help improve outcomes. When we went and visited uh, 11 particular parts of the country and talked to them about how they, <clears throat> about how they were delivering care as a system, what we found was those, those communities where there were established relationships and a clear understanding of local populations meant that they were able to respond to, to COVID more effectively. And what our appeal, we would appeal to local leaders to say that they must actively seize this opportunity to collaborate and build the capacity to, to take advantage of the relationships which have been which have been deepened and improved as a consequence of the work they've done during COVID to help respond to the needs of their area, not just within health and social care, the, the normal the normal providers, but also people outside uh, that, that normal group of health and social care providers. So there's a community response to what we think needs to happen to improve people's overall health outcomes. Adult social care was fragile as a result of a lack of a local, local funding solution. COVID has magnified that fragility. We know that funding, staffing and operational support all must be tackled to, re, to, 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 to make sure that the short term interventions that have been, uh, that have been offered by government turn into long term solutions. I think everyone in the sector would welcome the 3.7 billion pounds which has been which have been put in by government during the last few months and and in previous winters the short term funding solutions but providers are unable to make the long term investments in infrastructure staffing and planning new services if they are working on the basis of short term uh, funding funding solutions and it's also important that when those that, that that money comes from government it passes to the front line very quickly we know we've heard from providers who've talked about the idea that they've heard on the news that the government's put money into the sector, but that money hasn't translated into their bank accounts. And in, and in organizations that are, are reliant on, on week by week funding, this can be a real challenge for organizations that are, 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 more, are, are not making significant profits at the moment. This is a real challenge for them. There also needs to be a new deal for the care workforce. We've talked before about the need for clear career progression, clear, clear, uh, clear offer in terms of skills and training. And more importantly, I think, clear recognition of the value that health and social care offers, and particularly in social care. 
a real sense that, that working in social care is a prestigious occupation, a sense that a 17 year old who sits in school today can look, look up and think, actually, I want to go and work in, in adult social care. I see this as a long term career, a career of huge value, and I can see myself working up through it uh, and, and spending my life doing something really, really worthwhile. And COVID is also magnifying inequalities in, in acute care. The, the fact that there's been a real focus on, on COVID care is, is of course to be welcomed in the pandemic, but it does mean that screening services, diagnosis and elective care has, ha, have been reduced. That is going to have an impact in, in hospitals, but it's also going to have an impact in primary care as well. We know that some life-changing operations have still not been rescheduled. We need to, need to make sure that as services are redesigned and that we come out of this first wave of COVID, we need to make sure that the non-COVID patients are not left behind. Collaborative partnerships between providers to protect services are, are necessary because this is not just a hospital problem alone. We need to make sure those non-COVID patients get the care that they really, really need. And from a CQC point of view, we know that some services were struggling before COVID. We know that some services were struggling before COVID for reasons that are nothing to do with COVID. So we will continue to highlight factors like commissioning and staffing, which cannot be addressed by providers alone and demand a national response. We will help to build resilience and look, and look to support providers who are trying new ways to improve care. For those providers who are ambitious for people that, that, that they look after, then we, will want, we want to be alongside those providers, helping to support innovation and improvement. But we also need to maintain, make sure that we, we give a clear message to the public that we will maintain scrutiny on services and we will take action to protect people where that is necessary. I said earlier on that our report talked about a, 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 a time of two parts, pre-COVID and post-COVID. Pre-COVID, we saw a health and care system which was generally good, but there were fault lines for some people. Some people were not receiving the care that they needed and were falling behind. If we don't address inequalities in, in the health and care system now, those fault lines risk turning into chasms and we will lose people. We need to make sure that, that as we come out of this first wave of COVID and we enter a COVID era, the health and care system is designed for, 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 as a system that works for everyone. And I think there, is grounds, there are grounds for optimism here. That first wave spirit of innovation that, that delivered hospitals in a matter of days, that reconfigured the relationship between social care and, 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 and secondary care, that brought, uh, that brought such innovation in, in general practice around um, uh, remote consultations, that created new treatment protocols that, that had, hadn't, hadn't, been, uh, hadn't been seen before. All of these things came together in a matter of days and weeks. That spirit of innovation it was, was there and delivered enormous change in the health and care system, delivered change which many people had said was simply not possible. The health and care system proved that change is possible. If that same first wave spirit of innovation is applied to designing a new health and care system fit for a COVID era, and let's be honest, COVID is here to stay for a while longer. Um, we need to design services that, that, that both, both works for COVID patients, but works for non-COVID patients as well. And when we've seen that this work well, what we've seen is providers working collaboratively together in systems, both inside health and social care, but also linking out into their communities. And of course, we need action now for social care. Social care has become even more fragile than it ever was. Now is the time for action on social care, action on funding, but also action on support for workforce. And all of this is focused around making sure that no one is left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us to talk about the state of care in this country in 2020. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ian. Great, okay. So just a quick reminder of the, where we go from here. I'm going to do a Q&A. You can see a chat, hopefully, in your, in your screen at home. 
what we'd like you to do is put the questions in in that q a uh, what i'll do is i'll just try and pick out some of the questions that are that are coming up and if you've got uh if i call your question what i'd like you to do is just to go through your question uh with uh, directly to the to the panel and then we'll answer it in that way um we have got a couple of questions already in the uh in the chat, the first one of which is from um, Bren. I wonder if you could, Bren, I wonder if you could, uh, you'll be unmuted, I wonder if you could come off mute and, uh, and just, just talk through your question. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Can you all hear me okay? We can, Bren. And um, so I, I think I put two in, Chris, really, but my question is how are we going to ensure as we move forward with tackling health inequalities our leaders across all sectors move away from actually oh it's jump chris no you're still still going brand it's fine yeah so i just got it back actually or perceiving to control and not empower people and communities how do ICSs become enablers and not disablers? That's my question. Thanks very much for that, Bren. Um, Rosie, is that, is that one that you could take for us? Yes, yeah, certainly. And hello, Bren. Um, it's a very good question and something I think is really, really important um, for ICSs and all providers actually working in systems to consider. I think it's absolutely vital uh, that uh, providers and integrated care systems and primary care networks work very closely with the local communities to really ensure that the voice of all people is heard. And that includes people with the quietest voices. Um, and I think uh, it's it's also very important that they spend the time really understanding the local needs and then working with their local communities uh, to, to co-design um, solutions that are going to really work with those uh, local populations uh, in partnership so there's an equal relationship. Um, we've been looking at this through our 11 reviews, our provider collaboration reviews, and there is a, a, a section of the report um, today that actually details a lot of this work um, and shows some of the brilliant examples that we've seen across the country where this has worked really well where we've had um, people working with local faith groups and local voluntary groups um, to really co-design and deliver better services during such a challenging time so I would encourage people to have a look at that section of the report but it is something we, we very much are encouraging and will continue to encourage and work as ICS is develop and primary care networks develop we will be working with them to ensure that uh, that partnership working occurs thank you Bren thank you Rosie thanks Chris no problem, thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Selena, one of our experts by experience. I think I, I might take Chair's privilege with this, Selena, but do you want to ask the question? Oh, sorry, I'm just juggling to unmute myself then. Um, technology. Yeah, um, so I work as an expert by experience um, as part of Choice Support, helping the CQC with inspections of health and social care services. I've been doing it for a few years now, and I know we've always had the challenge of reaching out to people to hear their voices who uh, obviously in hard to reach places since COVID um, everyone is even more socially isolated now and I'm wondering how can we reach them and hear their voices to ensure that they're receiving self safe effective care and responsive and well-led care. It's a great question um, and thank you very much for it and I think that it is as you rightly say it's even more important now than it ever was to make sure we can hear as Rosie described, those quiet voices. Um, I think there's three areas of work that we want to want to focus on. First of all, your role as an expert by experience um, is vitally important. And we are working with Choice Support on a number of different models about how we can hear the voice of people, uh, rather than just on, on inspections where we cross a threshold, but more directly. So we're having some, we're having some pilots of domiciliary care where we can, we can have a direct conversation with the service user uh, but remotely uh, and it's a it's a better conversation it's a, it, it's working really well and we're getting some really good information i think there's an opportunity to expand those type of services and we're working with choice support and how we might do that you will probably also have networks of people that operate in your area so we're talking to them about how we can um 
uh, bridge into those networks and hear the voice of people. Um, I think alongside that, I think the voice of people through the, the local and national groups that we work with, many of whom are on the call today, we have some, uh, some great partnerships with many groups that represent people who use services. And I think using those to help understand uh, perhaps regionally and with different conditions, uh, what people are thinking and feeling is very important. The last area for me is about the direct voice uh, through things like Give Feedback on Care, a service which we launched, relaunched this, just this year. That was designed to help us understand directly from people, directly from service users, how they are experiencing those services. What I would say is at a time when we are doing more responsive inspections, uh, around about half of the inspections that we do now are built on that, that the feedback from people that comes from things like Give Feedback on Care and from uh, our contact centre directly. I don't think, I don't underestimate the challenge there. There's, there's much more to do in this space, but I think those are three of the, the, the key bits of ingredients for me that will help drive, drive this forward. And just to say, again, your work is very, very important in that space, and we want to make sure we continue to develop that moving forward. I don't know if colleagues want to come in on that. Chris, I would just add, um, yeah. so we're doing some specific work at the moment about how we effective, effectively identify and regulate places that might be at risk of closed cultures. And our experts by experience, and I think some um, who are on the call today are part of an expert advisory group, um, helping us think about our methodology, but also critically how experts by experience can help us hear directly from people in those services about the quality of care that they're receiving. So there's a, a key developing role they're also helping us play about how we um, identify and regulate um, effectively places where there might be a risk of a closed culture. Can I come in on that as well, Chris? Thanks. Uh, Selena, thank you very much for your support. I mean, the work you do and, and your colleagues do as experts by experience is really important to us and listening to the voice of people using services is vital for us to understand and see the services from their perspective. I think as, we, as we're responding to COVID ourselves, we're developing what we're calling our transitional regulatory approach, which is, is our way forward uh, through the next few months until we develop our new regulatory approach uh, next year and that transitional regulatory approach is built upon a supportive monitoring uh, structure much more than than our previous approach but but right at the heart of that has to be people's voices people using services voices and we're building that in so we have a sense of how people are experiencing care and I think a lot of the report that we're publishing today does reflect on what we've heard from people about their experiences of care and how care uh, how access to care during the COVID pandemic has proved problematic for some people and how that is driving health inequalities. To come back to the question Bren was asking a while back. Thanks, Ted. Um, Amy from Sense, there's a question which sort of links to the conversation we've just been having. I wonder if you'd like to, to ask it. Hi, yes. Um, at Sense, we recently had a survey of uh, unpaid family carers with disabled loved ones. And over a third of them have not had care and support services resume uh, for them, uh, day centres, uh, community-based care. Um, I'd like to ask what can CQC do to support providers reopening community social care services for disabled people? And how can providers and CQC work together to represent these challenges and uh, the additional costs of reopening community services in a COVID secure way? to government and local authorities. Kate, is that one that you want to start off with? Um, thank you, Amy. So um, we've got two key roles here at CQC. One is the regulation of, of individual providers and the quality of care they deliver. And the other is our independent voice role, our, our ability to talk about uh, the quality of health and, and social care in the country as, as we are today. Um, the services you're referring to, I think, Amy, are services that fall outside of our current regulatory remit. So um, we don't have that uh, we don't have that method of being able to get in and have this conversation. But we do through our independent voice work. So as ever, what is critical is our ability to build that evidence base to say this is what we're seeing is happening out there in the sector. This is the impact for people, and this is what action needs to be taken on the back of it. Um, so really happy to, um, if you wanted to share your findings with us to help. Uh, build a picture about what has been the impact for people with social care needs about not getting access to um, that daytime support which can be critical for them in terms of contact with other people but also can often provide absolutely essential uh, respite for, for carers at home as well. well. One of Ian's points earlier was about this, this idea of how local systems come together and it isn't just about the formal regulated services it's about all the other services that provide 
the care for people right across um, um, health and care and and I think you're the, the vital part that those some of them uh, are not regulated some of those uh, daycare services that provide that vital link between people and their communities is, is really important I don't know if any of the colleagues wanted to, to, to come in on that okay um, yes Chris I was just gonna, oh, I was just going to build on that, that point I think the reason we are very interested in how systems work is on the back of the work that we we talked about last year around people's experience of care is, is driven by the way in which they move between services, whether that's, as Chris said, formal regulated services or, or other services in the community. So, you know, and we know particularly in around around mental health, that that makes a, a huge difference. So again, we've seen during COVID the, the impact that voluntary services, even informal voluntary services can have. Um, so we want to try and find ways to capture that in a reasonably structured way so that we can we can start to call out those areas where there are where there are there are uh, challenges thanks Chris. Okay, thank you thanks Ian um Catherine from the carers trust you make an important point about unpaid carers do you want to do you want to ask your question it's Catherine Hill from the ah, there we go yeah Might be on mute, Catherine. Oh, there you go. It's a phrase I've used too many times this year. Yeah, apologies. Apologies. Um, yeah, I'm Catherine Hill from Carers Trust. I suppose my, my question relates to why unpaid carers have had no recognition uh, regarding their contribution during this, this period of time. Um, they've not been able to access respite care services that they would be able to um, access for the cared for person had not been available. It's had a huge impact on carers of people with dementia. Young carers uh, have, have had their mental health disproportionately affected by this. Um, and at Carers Trust we can't understand why unpaid carers have had no recognition um, because without their contribution the whole social care enterprise would have collapsed. And my question is, what can the CQC do to ensure that um, and that the, the contribution of unpaid carers is, is recognised and that they are given the support they need to continue their caring role, particularly as the pandemic seems to be spiking again? Okay, are you okay to, to start that one? Yeah, so, um, so obviously some really uh, critical information was shared by your organisations a few months ago and from the top of my head, Catherine, um, I, I recall an additional 4.5 million people identified as, as taking on caring responsibilities during the pandemic, in addition to the fantastic contribution that carers have made to date. And there's some stat that says uh, informal carers uh, saves the country the equivalent of what it spends on, on the NHS. So uh, the role of carers is absolutely critical and we all know, um, from my previous job in, as director of social services often a small amount of support for carers goes a long way in terms of keeping their resilience up and, and, um, and supporting them to carry on doing what they often want to do which is providing you know looking after and living with their, their loved ones so um, it goes a bit back to um, the point I made around um, daytime support so we, um, we, our role in terms of being an independent regulator and talking about what we see out there in terms of health and social care, we are talking this year and we talked a lot last year about access and how the ability to access the right services at the right time and in the right place has a massive impact on the quality of that person's experience about accessing services. So um, we flagged access again um, this year um, and we will continue to do so when, um, you know, when those issues arise. I think it's fair to say we made it part an important part of the COVID Insight report as well. I think the information you provide on that was was really useful, and we will ourselves continue to uh, to highlight it in our independent voice um, reports. Um, there's a question from Rebecca, which is about uh, how can we make social care profession more attractive. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to go through that question in a bit more detail? Yeah. Oh, just because I mean I, I'm actually thinking beyond my remit at uh, um, RC Psych, it's something that we need to think about ac across the whole of the workforce and it's really difficult isn't it where social care has this I suppose um, 
view that it's understaffed across the nation, but we do know that mental health nursing, it's really difficult to get mental health nurses. Um, we also know that all aspects of social care seem to be under-resourced and it's something that affects us. So what do we need to do, uh, as well as just going to government with a begging bowl saying we need more, res more resources, how can we make this profession more attractive and one that people want to stay in? Important question. I think we, we covered a bit in the in the media this morning, but Kate, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, th thanks, Rebecca. So we, along with many other voices in this sector, are calling uh, today in our sector care report for, for this new deal for the social care workforce. So um, I don't know about you, but it feels like we've never talked about social care as much as we are now. And if we think about in the first um, 10 weeks of the pandemic where people came out and clapped for carers, so it very quickly stopped being a conversation just about health professionals, but it became about uh, the social care workforce as well. And that's great. And it's great the country's talking about it, but that needs to translate to a profession with the right terms, conditions, training and, and career pathways. So some of this is about money. Some of this is about commissioning. Um, but a lot of this is about how we as a society value this as a role um, there's something about how health and social care work together to make these jobs attractive as well so we've seen some examples where in a system so where in a place health and social care providers work together to grow their workforce to uh, give people opportunities to gain experience in other in other areas as well um, often a joined up approach to it can help provide some of those those career pathways but what's absolutely critical that we're calling for today is let's take this great focus that there's been on the fact that social care workforce when most of the country were you know locking locking themselves uh, locking down uh, during um, the first wave of the pandemic and social care workers were driving around the country delivering care in people's homes and going into care homes let's see that now translate to the right uh, the right money the right conditions the right training and you know our aspiration and ian said it um during his presentation you know my, my dream would be kids in school thinking about careers uh, say actually i want to i want to go into social care and it's a job that i can be developed in i can get a mortgage with I can raise my kids on and I can have a fulfilling kind of 40, 50 years in a sector where unlike many jobs out there, you know, you finish a shift and you feel like you've actually had a meaningful impact on someone's day. Um, so, so that would be, that would be the dream really. Any other comments from anybody else? In which case we move on to Jonathan um, from VoiceAbility, Chief Executive VoiceAbility. Um, Jonathan, do you want to ask your question about right support, right care, right culture? Hear me okay? Yep, here you find Jonathan. Oh, brilliant, Th thank you. Um, it's almost a decade since Winterbourne View. We've not seen enough progress at, at every level from the, the whole scale systematic change that we know that's needed to invest properly in community-based support, in supporting families, in stopping the kind of breakdowns that lead to, to people lead, uh, living in inpatient ser services. We've also not seen nearly enough uh, progress with people at the real, real sharp end of this, people that are, uh, are suffering within inpatient settings. And we've seen repeated scandals around that. We've got so much guidance, um, so many recommendations. I was responsible uh, personally as chair of the uh, NICE committee uh, on the guidance for um, learned disabilities um, and behaviour that challenge the service models. We do need some real action. You've set out, um, again, sort of an increase in the number of inadequate uh, mental health wards for people with learning disabilities. Um, you've set out in the right support, right care, right culture the importance of uh, the right service model for people. So I'm really interested in your comments on the CQC's preparedness to reconsider the registration of existing mental health wards for people with learning disabilities that don't conform with the, the model that, that's outlined. Uh, Ted, do you want to start with that one? Well, yes, I will. Jonathan, I, I have to say that I fully support what you've said. It's taken far too long for the model of care for people with learning disabilities and autism to have changed. And, and I think uh, we all need to look at ourselves and say, what can we do more to make a difference to this? And CQC is fully committed to doing whatever we can to drive the new model of care that, is, this is, that has been 
clearly needed for, for a long time. Uh, and the, this, this year's report identifies, again, unsatisfactory care in some of these inpatient facilities that we found over the last year. Uh, and it appears to have got worse. Before COVID, it was deteriorating, and the pressures of COVID, I think, have added to that as well. And, 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 but the underlying issue is the model of care, as you, as you emphasize. The model of care has been laid out, the, the, the right model of care has been laid out for, for a long period now, and we need to move those services to that model of care. And that means all parts of the system working together, and CQC is very much gonna be part of that. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, 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 you know, drawing attention to this as an issue, and we are committed to doing whatever is necessary. We've used our registratory powers over new services being set up, although the, uh, I think we must recognise that quite a few of the services that are already in the establishment may not be the mo full model of care, but are providing good quality care. Uh, and what we don't want to do is, is to undermine those until a new model of care has been set up and people have the right care in the right place, rather than this uh, uh, old fashioned model of care that they have at the moment. It's fair to say as well, we've got a report coming out um, next week, which talks a bit about this in more detail with some particular recommendations uh, that are specific for um, government ourselves and other parties as well. Does anybody else want to come in on that question before we move on? No? Um, yeah, yeah. If, I, if I just as well, well, Chris, so um, uh, the right support, right care, right culture, you mentioned, Jonathan, so this is a, a revised, refreshed guidance that we put out uh, three years ago, and the focus is on outcomes for people, uh, looking at things through the human rights lens, but also ensuring that people are accessing small person-centred services, and what's critical is our new guidance emphasises this isn't just at the point of registration, but this is also when we go out and regulate services, that's what we, we expect to see. And uh, within social care, we are doing our bit in terms of shaping the market by um, refusing to register services that don't meet that best practice around um, small and person centred. But if I can just emphasise the point Ted makes, this only works if we get that consistent offer around the country around crisis support for um, adults with learning disabilities, autistic people and people in a mental health crisis where for the majority of those people, you get the right wraparound support and they can stay where they are. Um, in the uh, rare occasions that an inpatient stay is needed, it needs to be short, it needs to be with the right uh, interventions and they need to be supported to get back to their normal place of residence as soon as possible. Thanks, Kate. Um, Jabir, you raised an important question um, about um, mental health, uh, well, mortality and, uh, and BME communities. Um, I think that's probably a question that, that may have a couple of people who want to come in on it, but Ted, you, would you like to start? I think Jabir's asking about maternal mortality. Uh, uh, yes. So, so just, just to emphasise that, Jabir, we, we highlight in this report again that 41% that of uh, maternity services in the country are requires improvement for uh, uh, safety. Uh, and I think earlier in the year we published a report where we highlighted this as an issue. Uh, and I think our summary of where we are at the moment is that, that while maternity services have made improvements, they haven't made sufficient improvements and more needs to be done to improve maternity safety going forward. Uh, you raised the issue about the difference in health outcomes for people from a BME background. There's very, very marked difference in maternal mortality uh, for, for people from a BME background, but also neonatal mortality. And I think the, the inequalities in, in maternity provision are a very important feature of the safety uh, and culture of maternity services. And as we go forward, we're, we're, we're starting a, uh, a, a new programme of risk-based inspections of maternity services, looking primarily at safety. And one of the key features we'll be looking at is, is the culture of those services and how they address inequalities to make sure that all women are getting the best possible care. Jopia, did you have anything you particularly, I know I can see the question on the screens, anything else you wanted to say around the question or in terms, in terms of uh, Ted's answer? Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Ted, for, for, for your response. I think the, the worry I have, and uh, it's, it's part of my, my question, is that actually this has been an issue for a very long time and has been evidenced for a very long time. And here we are in 2020 still saying that this is something we need to address. And my fear is that actually we might be sitting here in uh, next year and saying the same thing again with, with little evidence that we've, we've progressed it and I think the CQC play a really crucial role in in holding people to account in including the the providers to actually demonstrate that 
they're taking this seriously and delivering on change. Uh, and Jimmy, are we committed to doing that? Uh, the, the, the issues around maternity safety do need addressing. And I think I've said very clearly publicly, there does need to be a, a, a real focus on the culture of safety in maternity units. And as you say, the, the aspects of inequality of outcomes are an important part of that. So we're very committed uh, to, to holding providers to account for that and to drive forward the improvements necessary. Thanks. Um, Jonathan, you've got a really interesting question about the speed of innovation uh, at the start of COVID. I, I wonder if you could just go through your question. Thank you very much, Chris. Can you hear me all right? We can. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yes, I'm, I'm Jonathan Steele. I'm a GP, but I'm also the lead fellow for social care at the College of Physicians. So interfaces are my real interest. And, and thanks for noticing the speed at which we managed to improve the relationship between secondary care and social care right at the beginning of COVID. And, and it, it vexes me that the same people were there before COVID that were there during that time that are there now. So rather than just state this, we have to understand the dynamics that were going on and then do something about those dynamics. And I'd be interested to hear from the panel what your view on those dynamics are. I think maybe this one that you, Rosie, do you want to cover then perhaps Ian as well? I don't know if you want to come in on that as well, but Rosie. Thanks, Jonathan, and a really good question. And this was something particularly we were interested in exploring with our first round of provider collaboration reviews, which looks specifically at the relationship between health and health and care um, during the first wave of the pandemic. And um, a lot of what we found in that first wave actually was similar to the findings we found in the local system reviews a couple of years earlier in terms of the importance of relationships, um, the importance of having a common vision, um, the importance of understanding the population needs in a lot of detail. And actually, when we looked at what had happened in COVID, uh, there was rapid innovation across all parts of the sector. Um, probably aided by technology in many places. I think that was a huge enabler. We found uh, people rather than spending hours traveling to meetings together were having uh, very quick kind of Zoom calls instead, which uh, helped them get together much more um, quickly. Um, and also we found use of technology in terms of uh, people connecting uh, with different sectors to offer advice. So secondary care consultants, uh, supporting care homes and, and those type of things by uh, using technology. I think, um, I think in terms of why it's happened now, I think that common goal has been really important and that, that real need to work. And, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, that need to work with the local communities, which I think is also a really important part of that, uh, this, this that actually helps some of those developments happen. Many of the barriers, I think, uh, that people perceived that were there pre-COVID uh, were probably perceived rather than uh, reality. Clearly, there are some barriers uh, in place that we need to continue to work through and make sure that uh, they're addressed. Um, but certainly, it's, it's our ambition as a regulator to continue to enable and support uh, systems and, uh, and different providers to work together. I think it's completely it's a it's a necessity not a nice to do collaboration i think it's absolutely it's what we expect our providers to be doing to meet the needs of their local population and we absolutely want to support that going forward Jim, do you want to say more about that thanks jonathan i mean i i think just building on that one of the things that Ms. rosie said we we saw was that relationships locally made a big difference i think the challenge for us is how do we codify that because i can so i can talk about that as a quality nice to have of course we want to we want to have relationships locally but what does that really mean so in terms of our, our methodologies in the future we are going to be asking more questions around at a provider level as to uh, how they are working collaboratively with with, with neighbors and what they're doing but i do think there's a there's a broader challenge around around social care in particular social care is effectively twenty five thousand private businesses the, the, there's a very unstructured relationship and uh, arguably quite a transactional relationship in some parts of the country between the local authority and some of the social care uh, organisations. And remember that half of half of social care is actually delivered from from one private business to a private individual who pays their own fees. So uh, there's something in in all of this for me around around mutual expectations and making sure that everyone understands who's working and active on their patch. 
um, particularly we've got you know large social care groups that will be active on multiple in multiple geographies so I, I think there is something in here a kind of speed of trust conversation to say well who are the players on my patch do I understand who they are you know on, on prosaic things like have I got their mobile phone number in my phone um, we've found those sorts of quite prosaic things people are, are citing as things that make a difference uh, and then more formal formalized approaches can build from there but i think certainly I'm, I'm very keen that we try and capture and codify some of these things so we can start to look for themes uh, and start to you know almost do some primary research here around around what does make the difference because i'm not sure anybody really understands what catalyzes those relationships uh, that work brilliantly well in some places and and maybe much less well in the in others thanks chris uh, sandra you've got uh, from the president of the royal college the pharmaceutical society you're you've got a very similar question i think in a similar space do you want to do you want to ask it it might sort of follow on nicely from this um, yes, I, I think it has partly been answered. Uh, the question was that the report rightly makes much of local leadership and collaboration. Um, is there anything CQC can do to nudge this behaviour in the right direction or is it already part of the well-led assessment? And, and I'm, a profession, I'm from a profession that's um, in community pharmacy that's not regulated by uh, CQC, so there may be some collaboration with other regulators involved. Ian, would you like to, I mean, it sort of builds on what you've just said before, but would you like to start that one? And if any of the colleagues want to come in, uh, we, we can do if that's OK. Yeah. Yes, I, I think I think the work we've been doing on systems is that is is the start is the starting point there, um, because I, I do think there is something here about uh, taking into account um, organizations like, like like your Sandra or, or the work that your that your your members uh, carry out plus the, the conversation we were having earlier on around around the impact of unpaid carers the voluntary sector and so forth all of these groups coming together to to to, um, to deliver care at a locality level uh, which is so it's more than it is considerably more than just the, the providers that CQC regulate. So um, I, I'm not sure there's a, there's, a, there's a simple answer to this, but mm -hmm. I think the fact that we're all now having a system conversation in a way that 18, 24 months ago, we probably weren't. Um, you know, people are talking now about, um, about formalizing a lot of the, a, a lot of integrated care. You know, the, the, I'm expecting legislation to, to, be, to be coming forward in the next few, few months to, to start to formalize some of these, the, these informal relationships. I think all of this moves us in, in, in the right direction. Uh, and, and our role, I think, in terms of the, the regulated sector, in terms of the, the people we regulate, is to include in our methodologies questions around how well are you collaborating with others? And if you're not, then that, ha that there's, there's a consequence in terms of your rating. And, and, and that's kind of our, that's our direction of travel, I think. I don't know whether Rosie wants to add to that. Yeah, so I would, if that's okay, Ian, uh, firstly say we're going to continue to explore this with the provider collaboration reviews and we're going to be a, doing a series of further provider collaboration reviews. We're currently on site doing some around urgent and emergency care. Um, we're absolutely aware of the, the huge critical role that community pharmacy play in, in, in delivering care uh, for all sorts of, uh, for every kind of condition and every uh, uh, for, for patients, that's that's absolutely critical, um, and we are really keen to understand the role of community pharmacies in um, in those urgent emergency care discussions. So our teams are our med team is certainly going out to have those uh, local conversations. Um, the, the following uh, provider collaboration reviews, the next one will be on cancer, then we're doing one on uh, mental health and then learning disabilities. Um, and so we're really keen to look at uh, how we can capture what's happening across all of the parts of the system in that work. Um, the other thing just to mention is as part of the work we're doing around primary care networks, we know that uh, community pharmacies will play a critical part in those primary care networks and that's something we want to explore over the coming months and years. Thanks Rosie. Uh, there's a question from Stephen Dunn, unfortunately Stephen's had to leave but I'll just, I think it's an important one so I'll, I'll ask it um, for, for, for you to answer if that's okay Ted. Uh, what are the main safety concerns you are focusing on? What worries you about as we approach a Covid enhanced winter and what support is available to organisations that we should be aware of? Well, I'm grateful for Stephen for his question, because as you say, it is really important. And I think it is a real concern 
to us going into winter as it is for a, a lot of the health service go, going forward, uh, acute hospitals particularly. Uh, last winter was difficult. Uh, the, 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 we had the reports on the inspections we did last winter and we found a lot of problems with flow through emergency departments, creating crowding and safety issues in emergency departments. And that's reflected in the data that Ian showed a little earlier on, where he showed how many uh, emergency departments were requires improvement or inadequate uh, uh, rated as such. Uh, going into this winter, uh, we've been working over the summer with a group of uh, clinicians from uh, A&E departments all over the country, uh, good and outstanding units, to ask them how units can best prepare for winter, uh, particularly a winter that is going to be affected by the increased cases of COVID. And we published that guidance uh, a few a week or two ago. It's called Patient First. It's been widely circulated and very widely received. And anyone out there who hasn't seen it, who's involved in this area, I would encourage them to look at it. Where in terms of support for acute trusts, we're going to be ringing acute trusts using our, our transitional monitoring uh, uh, approach going forward uh, to discuss with them how they've uh, implemented the guidance and what, what they've learned from it so we can share the best practice and learning further going into the winter. Uh, but the guidance isn't just for acute trusts, it's also for the systems in which they work. The pressures in emergency departments and in acute medicine driven by winter, driven by COVID, are, are, are issues for the whole system. And Rosie was just talking about the provider collaboration reviews we're doing on urgent and emergency care. And that is absolutely key. There has to be collaboration across the system to make sure that people with acute needs get the best possible care in the right setting. Stephen, I may have done you a misservice. I, I, I close to saying you might, you might not be there, but does, does that answer your question if you are there? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, brilliant. Uh, thank you, uh, Ted. Uh, so, uh, and you picked it up beautifully, uh, Chris. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, sorry to have kind of written you off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, apologies for that. Uh, don't worry. I've been written off lots of times, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Baroness Tyler uh, about uh, visiting. Uh, Baroness, would you like to ask that question? Hello, can you hear me now? We can. Good, thanks. Um, I should declare an interest first because I do have a, a close family member who's in a care home. Um, my, my question really, my concern is about what sort of priority and focus CQC is giving to the whole issue of family members being able to visit uh, their loved ones in care homes. Like we heard a lot about it on the radio this morning. Um, we've heard heart-rending stories. Um, obviously, I feel quite... Uh, you know, quite sort of keenly about it myself. I fully understand that it requires uh, some, you know, equipment, staffing, resources, the ability probably to test and provide PPE to family members. But I do sense that there's not enough sort of will in some quarters, and I'd like to know what priority you're going to give to this issue to balance out the, the, the sort of the risk and the safety issues with the human rights issues uh, for families and care home residents. And just to sort of try to crystallise it. When I signed a contract to let, you know, say about my mother going into a care home, I didn't sign something saying that she could be sort of held there as a prisoner uh, without me being able to go in and see her. So I really would like to see you sort of talking about it more and giving it more priority. Important question. Kate, would you like to uh, talk to that? Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you for raising this really important topic. And as you say, it's featured heavily on Radio 4 this week and, and, and on BBC News as well, along with uh, many other people in the sector talking about it. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that um, social care providers at the start of this pandemic, when none of us knew what we were we were facing, um, I believe absolutely made decisions that they needed to in the best interests of their current residents. And for, for a number of providers that involved quite significant restrictions around uh, um, enabling people to come into the home. But I think that came from a place of wanting to keep people, keep their current residents um, safe. I think we're six months on now and the toll it has taken on people's mental well-being and the mental well-being of their family members grows more and more significant week by week. Um, we've seen lots of providers go to fabulously creative uh, lengths to enable visiting to happen. 
but we are saying so our position on this is we expect providers to follow government government guidelines to pay close attention to what the local risk is in their area and what the advice is from their directors of public health but we absolutely expect providers to proactively explore on an individual basis how they can make um, visiting happen for those residents in a way that is safe so we've uh, put our position out there and uh, the Care Provider Alliance has shared some information with providers about how that could be implemented as well. And we, when we go out now and inspect services, so we've got a new in infection prevention control uh, way of inspecting that we developed over the summer that looks at eight areas of assurance around whether a, a care home is uh, providing uh, high quality care around infection prevention control and it covers things such as training uh, access to personal protective equipment testing staff etc but also there is a focus in that about how is that service enabling visiting to happen in a way that is safe so what's really important is this is so individual it's down to individual residents but they are in a context of a care home that might be an old building uh, that's in a context where there will be a local risk level and the government guidelines um, obviously changes as the pandemic changes so we will continue to talk about it be clear about our expectations and we will be looking at it as we continue to go out and do infection prevention control inspections and one final thing if you or uh, if anyone is concerned about the way uh, this is being managed or uh, if that you want to give us any feedback on the quality of care your loved one is receiving uh, within a, a health or social care setting then we've got our give feedback on care uh, mechanism and as Chris said I think earlier in this chat uh, we've had a huge increase in the amount of people telling us about the quality of care that's happening out there that is absolutely welcomed and each bit of that feedback is a really useful bit of intelligence for us that helps us have as most an up-to-date view of the quality of care that's happening out there but it also helps us understand the risks as well so we can focus our priority about when we might go out and visit a, a service in person to, to see what's going on for ourselves. Great, thanks, Kate. Right, just to do just do a time check. We've got thirty minutes and twenty two questions, so um, so we don't get any more. So I might ask both the people asking and and, those, and my colleagues and myself uh, responding to try and be as succinct as we can. The next question is from Emily uh, Carers UK. Hello, hello there. Thanks Hi. very much. Hi. Um, some very. Uh, you know, I'll cut my, cut my comments down. So my question, my question is really what data are you getting through from among pay carers? So that's, that's the first thing to look at the impact on them. And the second is a systems question because we often talk about unpaid carers in relation to social care, but our data showed that 81% had treatment cancelled or delayed compared with 77% of the general public. And I find that extremely worrying for the future sustainability of carers, the health family, but also it's a whole systems across, whole systems approach we need to take to carers as well. Okay, I think that's probably, it starts with uh, uh, Kate, then a bit of Rosie, if that's okay. Um, so in terms of what, what data we get, Emily, so, so um, our ability to have a view of access, it's, it's a really tough one to capture, isn't it? Because it's often the people we don't see. It's often the people that don't come into the regulated service where we have good visibility and we can comment authoritatively about the quality of care that they're getting. So we are often reliant on numerous other sources, including your own organisation, to say what you are seeing out there in, in terms of access. And, and where we've got that, we can pull that together um, and, and, and shine, a, shine a spotlight on it. Um, so I was just going to say in primary care, we had, we do look in our inspection activity, we look at unpaid carers, we look at, uh, particularly in general practice, at how uh, people are registered as unpaid carers and ensure that the support is given from uh, primary care. It would be really good to see your data so we can understand uh, what we need to do uh, further in this area So uh, going forward. So if we could link up outside of this meeting, that would be really helpful. But I think this is something that does need to be approached on a system-wide level. I think we do need to be understanding how the whole system is supporting uh, unpaid carers and and actually, I think it's going to be important that we actually really understand, it goes back to understanding how do systems really understand their population needs and make sure that they're addressing those appropriately. Thanks, Rosie. Next question from somebody who's been on the other side of this stage uh, before virtual and actual, uh, Andrea from the uh, NMC. Andrea, what's your question? And welcome. Hi. Hi. 
Lovely to see you all. Um, thank you very much for the report and uh, really welcome focus on the workforce and also on social care. So well done you Kate. Um, we've seen um, nurses and midwives uh, alongside other healthcare professionals make a huge contribution in the COVID response this year. But there have been concerns about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on staff people in communities from black asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and also a real challenge to the mental health and well-being of staff so my question is how can the cqc use its review of how well led a service is to address these particular points and also work with professional regulators like the nursing and midwifery council and the general medical council to create the right environment for our professionals to flourish thank you thanks andrea ted that, that's, that's a very good question, Andrea. Thank you very much for it. It, it raises several really important points. Uh, Ian started off uh, his talk by playing tribute to the staff working in the front line of health and social care, who showed extraordinary commitment and probably one of the strongest things we had, strongest assets we had going into this pandemic was the commitment and dedication of our frontline staff. And, and we've heard stories personally from them about uh, 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 the, the challenges they faced, but also the very distressing uh, uh, circumstances they found themselves working in. And I think uh, it, it, having worked in the NHS for many years, I'm not surprised by that, but I'm still in awe of it in, the, in, in that sense. And I think we, we need to make sure that we provide them with the maximum support during this COVID pandemic and talking to staff uh, who are looking forward to the next few months. I think there's real concern about uh, the pressures on staff going into the pandemic. You emphasise some other points which I think are really important. One is the disproportionate effect on staff from a BME background. You know, and this is all part of uh, our assessment of well-led and how well staff are supported and how well staff from a BME background are supported in trust. We've been very, we've been key in promoting the uh, workforce race equality standards and going forwards into the, our, our, our development of the world there, they're going to be central to our world led assessment because because what we've recognised is that those organisations that do workforce race equality well do other things well as well. They are the well led organisations with the right culture. Can I just highlight one other thing that I think is really important about staff well-being as well? And that is we've got to create a culture in which people are not fearful about speaking up about their concerns. Uh, and I think one of the problems we see often in services that are not doing well is that there is genuine fear amongst the staff in those services about being honest about things that are worrying them about the quality of care they're providing. And we've got to create a culture, and it, it is a real challenge in our services to create a culture where people are free to speak up and will talk about the things they're worried about in a way that can lead to learning, improvement, and build that really good quality, multidisciplinary teamwork to make sure that people are getting the best care. And I think your final challenge at the end of your question is yes, we as, we as regulators need to work together, because just as we expect teams to work together, I think we as regulators need to work together. We need to be a good multi-regulator team to make sure that we are providing consistent leadership across health and social care to, to maximise well-being of staff and to maximise the safety of service users. Great, thanks Ted. Um, I can I add one more thing on that? Just that um, we've got several examples in our report uh, of innovations around staff wellbeing because there's been some areas that have been going very much over and above and putting in some fantastic support systems for their staff during the COVID pandemic. So uh, lots of examples in there. Thank you. Um, the reason I'm rushing is this does definitely does sort of turn off at 12, so it doesn't, it's not as if we can keep it going much longer. Alex, you asked two questions. I wonder if you can do me a favour and just try to uh, combine them into one, one ask of us about to go, Alex from uh, Shared Lives Plus. Yes, there were two attempts to ask the same question, so that's fine, Chris. Um, so uh, CQC's reports always focus people on um, the comparison between uh, how services are performing with uh, services of the same model. I'm interested in um, the disparities that are really clear between different models um, and how radical uh, you think that local and national government should be about getting people out of the models which are performing badly and into models. And obviously we'd include shared lives as, as one of these, which is performing really well, particularly as we're seeing that congregate settings are often not safe during the pandemic, whereas people living at home with the right support can be much safer. 
And um, although it's not in your report, shared lives as a sector is now 95% good or outstanding. So we've got models out there that are underused, which we think could be used much more widely. And I'm wondering if you take a view on that. Kate, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, so uh, let me check a quick, quick few things. So, um, so I think we absolutely can shine a spotlight on what is working well and where there is quality. There isn't an automatic link between a model and the quality of care is given, but we know that certain types of way of delivering care are more likely to lead to more person-centered outcomes. So for example, if you're an adult living in a shared life scheme in terms of uh, having a say over how your day goes and you know, the way the meals you wanna eat, et cetera, might be easier to achieve than if you're a, uh, an older person living in an 80 bedded um, service for example so I don't think they are mutually um, e exclusive but there is uh, often that link that you can see um, in in the way that the models of care um, are delivered um, as, as you know Alex we um, don't uh, we don't regulate commissioning um, but what we can do is we can talk about when commissioning is impacting on the quality of care that we are regulating and we will we will continue to do that so so we will um, we will talk about what's working well we publish reports quite regularly about innovation and that can include uh, innovation in terms of the way care is being delivered um, and we um, we are yeah we're, we're happy to, to to talk about what's what's working well out there and encourage uh, the development of that um, so that everyone gets you know, the high quality care you'd want. Great, thank you. Um, next question I think is from uh, Gary about uh, learned disability services. Gary, I wonder if you'd like to ask your question. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Right. Um, um, my my question is, um, I I have I have a learning disability, and the information. There's quite a few questions. Information you get is not an easy read, um, and every week on the television we get lots of information. And it keeps on changing every week and it, we just people like myself or, or autism can't keep up with all that information and the second question is we, we, we as people with learning disabilities would like to contribute by have by working as nursing staff key workers social workers and care workers how can you as a group make that happen for us? I think um, you ask, it's an important question. The first question of those is very important. So as an organisation, we do try to make sure our information is in easy read, but I think you're right at the time, particularly at the, the height of the first wave of the pandemic, there was very little information because it came out so quickly that it was actually put into easy read. We have, we've been having conversations with Public Health England and NHS England, the Department of Health and Social Care, who have responsibility for that guidance to try and make sure it is it, it does work in easy read. And we've also been working with a few um, uh, organisations to try and create those products because they are so important for people to be able to access them. Um, I don't know, Kate, do you want to say anything more about it from your perspective? Or the, the, the only other thing I'd say, thanks, Gary, is um, so obviously our, our relationship with experts by experience, and we've got a number of those colleagues on, on the call, is critical. And we are increasingly looking for our experts by experience. So we've got a... a, a we're, we've got a growing number of people who actually have experience uh, accessing services themselves working as, as experts by experience. And this is a great opportunity to bring your expertise uh, to that role and to help inform the way we um, regulate uh, services. And, you know, I could only uh, guess that, um, you know, working as an, an expert by experience might give uh, good opportunities for other, uh, other kind of careers um, on, off of the back of that. So um, I don't know whether you are one, um, but uh, there may be a conversation you want to have at some point about might that be something you're you're interested in great thanks and yes definitely if you are uh, let us know um uno from uh skills for care you've got uh, an important question for us hello 
Hello, yes. I, my, um, I was giving a, a, a bit of a heads up that we're launching our um, state of the uh, adult social care workforce report uh, next Wednesday on the, um, the, the 21st of October. And it's just really to, um, to, to confirm, I suppose, or welcome the, um, the, the focus on, on workforce and, um, and that sense of this is a, a, a real growth sector in terms of workforce and we need to be uh, building that that early uh, and building the, the value and recognition of the, of the workforce uh, career progression being, being really important and also um, a, a, sense of, a sense of value and how we start to think about that uh, earlier. Uh, so, so just to make, to make that point about um, how key it is that, that workforce is really central to quality. Adrian, yeah, if I could just respond. Thanks, Anna. We're looking forward to your report coming out um, next week. I think it would be important that there's um, there's a kind of narrative happening at the moment that's saying that as people are sadly losing their jobs in hospitality and retail. Um, that these would be a, a good funnel of people who can move into social care and I think there's been I think there's some you know recruitment uh, portals that are saying that there has been a slight increase in people applying for social care jobs but we'll hear the data when when your report comes out next week I think for me there's something really important about this 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 needs to be a job of choice so um, it might be that there's some great transferable skills from retail and hospitality in terms of uh, you know supporting customers etc but but I'm, I'm I'm really keen that this is this is a job that people come into and see stay in it's not a temporary job that people dip into because because another job has become unavailable and I just wondered Ona um, I see I, I don't know whether you can come back in but whether there's any reflections you might want to give on on that uh, there we go uh, yes, I, I think that's absolutely right, Kate. I think there's a, uh, this isn't just about broad uh, numbers. This is about having the right people with the right values in, in the roles. And I think we have seen a, a lot of new people coming into the sector, moving from other sectors. And I think we really want them to stay. So whenever the economy uh, uh, um, changes again and there's maybe more jobs opening in other sectors, what we don't want is an osmosis where people move out again. Yeah. Uh, so we really need to be be valuing those people when they're in, giving them training and development um, and, and helping them see what a fulfilling career career this is, as well as valuing the, the people who are already in the role. So particularly thinking about registered managers and uh, such a key role in terms of, of well-led uh, and, and, and leadership in, in general and, uh, and really struggling in the, in the pandemic. So how do we support new people coming into the sector to stay and how do we support our existing, uh, our existing staff through through this period uh, and the future i think great thank you neil a question from you uh from richmond group morning neil morning um i think there's a really strong message coming through from the report today about kind of how the um the, the seeds of opportunity from the rapid response uh, and that spirit of innovation that, that Ian talks about uh, can help us deal with some of the really serious challenges the system is already facing, which the first part of the report really brings home. And from our point of view, we, we have a real focus on the needs of the many millions of people living with multiple conditions um, which need them to interact with a whole range of services and forms of support often that's across both physical and mental health conditions so I'd be really interested in the thoughts you have about sort of where the key opportunities are what's going to make the most difference in enabling systems and places and providers to, to make a tangible difference for people with those, those multiple conditions. Uh, Rosie? Yeah, shall I come into that? Hi, Neil. Um, it's a really good question. And as we all know, there are millions of people with multiple long term conditions. And actually, if you speak, I'm a GP by background. I've spoken to many people with long term conditions, and it can be a full time job actually going to all of the different appointments. And this, it can be very, very confusing for people if they, they're going to lots of different places and they've got lots of different advice for coming from. Uh, different people. So I think it's absolutely imperative that people in local systems join up services around the needs of the person, that there's time considered about what uh, working with that person and that individual, looking at personalised care planning, looking at having a shared plan to meet the, the goals, meet the needs of that person, and that that plan is widely understood by all services um, around the, who are meeting that person's needs. We see a huge amount of duplication actually if if someone's got uh, lots of different long-term conditions and um, a, a lot of um, uh, 
uh, particularly in, in certainly in health, if someone's got hypertension and someone's got cardiac disease and um, diabetes, often they can go to lots of different separate appointments. And that sometimes um, can add uh, to not delivering that person-centered care. So I think we need to be encouraging people to uh, really look at shared decision-making, working with uh, that individual personalized care planning, um, looking at that holistic care. So it is absolutely about physical and mental health care. They're, they're inextricable. You can't have one without the other and you need to be looking at both and supporting people from both point of view. I think the voluntary sector has a huge role to play with this. And I think that the communities that where we see this happening best are, are working with their local communities, working with voluntary sector organizations, um, working with different parts of the system to really enable uh, that partnership working between the person uh, receiving services and the person delivering the service. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Can I come uh, to you on that, Chris? Uh, okay. We published an important report today in parallel with State of Care on mental health care in acute hospitals. And I think one of the areas which gets little attention on the integration agenda is the, is the uh, integration between acute care for, for physical illnesses and mental health care. And as Rose has just said, as, if you, as you said, Neil, it, it, this is a really very important aspect. A lot of people have coexistent physical and mental health needs. And really we're looking for acute trust to focus on the mental health of patients under their care, but also much better co-working with mental health trusts. Thanks. And Nadia, you asked an important question about how members of parliament uh, might support the, uh, the report, particularly in, in terms of a, a green recovery. Do you want to uh, go through your question in a bit more detail? Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I'm the member of parliament for Nottingham East and was a care worker myself before I became an MP. So I'd like to thank the CQC for this report and much of your findings mirror my own experiences in care. Um, my question is about what thought you've given to um, care being integral to a green led recovery after COVID to solve those two big crises that we have of the social care crisis and the climate crisis. And what role you think cooperatives might play in this? Because we know that the care sector is very fractured um, has very low trade union density and that it's not just a question of funding but how social care is modelled too. So I think that cooperatives could be a really good way of sort of increasing user autonomy and power within the care sector. I think Ian mentioned a bit of this in, in his presentation. Do you, do you want to cover Yeah, <laughs> if, I, if I just kick, kick off that, I think, can I link that question? And there's a question further down, I think, from Matthew Hibbard at the LGA around uh, Big Bang versus uh, not Big Bang. Um, I, I think a couple of things here. One is we're doing some work on our 2021 strategy at the moment, and one of the components of that will be to what extent can we use our inspection methodology to look at um, green, uh, a green, green care-led uh, recovery. So um, we know that the NHS in particular is very interested in in how um, in the green agenda within um, the. You know, just long-term plan. The same argument uh, I, I know will be advanced by many local authorities with their with their local uh, their local plan. So bringing those things together, what can we do to to make sure that we are supporting uh, the plans that people have got in place? I think the point about ownership and structural models of social care is an interesting one. I, th I think one of the things that we saw at the beginning of the COVID pandemic is, in a matter of days. Uh, the, the governments centrally and locally went from having a fairly distributed, unstructured relationship with, with care providers to wanting to uh, quickly enforce guidance, quickly enforce new ways of, of doing things, uh, and then start to start to provide operational support in areas like delivery of PPE and so forth. And that was a, a very complex, almost change of direction um, but it did demonstrate, I think, the need to look at, in a more structured way at that relationship between local, central and, and those 25,000 individual separate uh, social care businesses and to work out how all of that works. And cooperatives and different ownership models have, of course, I think, got a 
got a part to play in all of that. But I think we also shouldn't shy away from the, the, the fact that in a number of areas, there is a need for for multi-million pound investment in in physical infrastructure to particularly when you you know when we're building care homes where you know many care homes are, are 50 60 70 years old uh, and just are not really fit for purpose for for for, a, for services in a covid era so i'm trying to bring a lot of those things together i, I do think there's a, an opportunity now for a, a bit of a rethink that says there was a big shock to the system it was a big bang of sorts the question is what's going to come out the other side of it and, and it's that's difficult to know that but certainly we're interested in what part we can play in terms of bringing regulation to the table as, as to, to help uh, the efforts that the government will will, will obviously be, um, be 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 making to uh, to to improve the overall uh, offer of social care to the country I think the other thing about it, we, we, we gather lots of insight about what's working well from new models of care. We see new models uh, and, and new services coming together in different ways. So I think the more we can share that, the more we, we can offer some um, hope about how services might improve, but also how other organisations can tackle innovation in, in a different way. We're down to the last five minutes. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, Helen from the uh, Relatives and Residents Association. Helen, your question. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I w as I was typing it, um, another question um, on this came in, but it picks up on it. So it's around the um, continued lack of visiting in care homes. Specifically, will CQC be working with the Department of Health and Social Care to urgently update the visiting guidance to end the isolation of residents and ensure their rights uh, are protected, particularly their right to wellbeing? Kate, you, you answered a bit of this earlier on, but do you want to just go into a bit more detail? Yes, thank you, Helen. And I know uh, your organisation has been doing a lot to keep a, a, keep quite rightly a focus on this really important topic. New information was issued yesterday about a plan about um, identifying a member of a family to be regularly tested to enable visiting. So that, that was department guidance that's landed yesterday that we probably all need a bit of a, an opportunity to digest and think about how that's implemented. Um, what I can give you is my assurance that we we will absolutely keep our focus on this um, in the coming weeks and months as we go out in, and inspect um, and provide that you know, support to providers to enable them to, to strike that balance of keeping residents safe, but also enabling people's well-being uh, to be met through the, the ability to see their, their loved ones um, when, when, when that's safe to do so. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Louise, I think this is a similar question one we had before, but uh, an expert by experience, and if you could just um, talk us through your question. Me. Can you hear me? Can. Yeah. Um, how can we move forward in inspecting services in person with the current COVID restrictions so we can know what's going on? Let me illustrate this. I was doing a remote inspection of a mental health ward, but the patients were having to sit right next to the member of staff in the office. So if there was anything untoward going on on that ward, how could they have spoken to us freely in that situation? So technology are going back to person. What are we going to do, please? I think it's fair to say that there are some we are piloting some new ways as you know we have choice support about how we how we do this and we're learning all the time so i think you you'll you absolutely make the right point about making sure people feel free to comment directly to us uh colleagues and if anybody else wants to pick up uh, uh, that uh point uh from your perspective kate or ted particularly um, so the only thing I'd say is um, Sarah Louise is, uh, um, is working with us around our close cultures work and thinking about how we can uh, go further in hearing directly from people uh, who receive services and we've been having an active conversation about the challenge about how you build a, as an inspector coming in, how you build that relationship and that rapport with someone who has communication needs, how you have the conversation with them in a space that is confidential uh, and, and the kind of complexities if they if they need a member of staff to, to support them. So it's an, it's an ongoing conversation. And the other things Sarah Louise is we are getting out and about more and more now so uh, we were absolutely only going out when we absolutely needed to in the early parts of the, the pandemic um, the numbers of physical inspections we've, we're doing are getting increasing e each week now and we've been doing some uh, modeling uh, as we speak about the, the increasing numbers of ex by, experts by experience will need to help us when we go out and do these visits as well. Uh, yeah, just to come back to that, I mean, we are we are learning what we can do well without going actually on site, uh, but we are always going to go on site for aspects of our inspections. It's, it's not as if 
we are moving to a model that, that doesn't require going on site. But in, in this COVID environment, we clearly need to minimise the risk to everyone by not making unnecessary visits on site. And we're looking at that constantly and learning as we go. Um, and I think, as I, as I said in my remarks, we're, we are calling upon providers to create services for a COVID era. Um, that's equally true for us as CQC. We need to create an, a method of regulation that is fit for a COVID era that, that, is, that, that connects in with, uh, with what providers are doing, but also gives the public the assurance that's a core part of our, of our, of our founding purpose. Great, thank you. I think we literally have got time for one more question. Um, and we take a question from uh, Dawn, the Royal College of Nursing, um, about the nursing workforce. Dawn, do you want to ask your question? Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, such a focus on social care. Really, really helpful for us. Um, I'm interested in the idea of social care profession, and uh, we know that, similar to, to healthcare, it's made up of a, a wide range of professions, and, and all of us as Royal Colleges have uh, involvement in ensuring that our specific workforces are well-versed and well-placed to support social care. I'm just wondering, from a CQC perspective, what you would like to see um, in terms of ensuring the workforce is, is fit for purpose um, and also that we manage the variations that sometimes occur countrywide in, in the access to care that, that people have. Do you want to start, okay? Yeah, thank, thanks Dawn. So, um, so ideally we would have a workforce plan that spanned health and social care and uh, gave the um, consistency about expectations, parity around pay, training and, and career progressions. There was another a question in the chat that we've not got to about um, uh, getting people, getting nurses into social care settings. And actually, if you're a nurse in a nursing home, that can be a very lonely job. You might be one nurse on a shift, uh, the only nurse in, on site. And for me, the way we need to move to is as increasing, people with increasingly complex needs are in these sorts of uh, places, these sorts of homes, uh, we need to make sure that that one registered nurse in a nursing home is part of a wider team. They might have different employers, but it's part of a wider um, uh, multidisciplinary team where there is clinical support and advice on standby should that be needed so i would be keen whatever we can do to come together to share our expectation that there is a single approach to workforce with with parity and, and career progression and and support great thank you i think that is we're just we're literally just a minute over time so i'm conscious i don't want to get to, as cut off ian do you want to say any final words before we uh, before we before we call, before we call it a day Thanks, Chris. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for, for joining us today. This is a, a really important report, I think. It's an important report that covers both what happened before COVID, but, but also uh, tries to summarise the last, last few months. We wanted to try and uh, put some insights on the table, which we hope uh, will, will help any second or, or subsequent wave planning um, as we enter into this COVID era. Of, uh, of health and social care. Once again, thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.